Hey everyone, today our session is on protecting your data from risk to and from in the cloud. My name is Etienne Nichols. I'm a medical device guru from Greenlight Guru. Today I'm joined by our presenters from Galen Data, Chris DuPont, the CEO, and Tim Sandberg, the VP of IT. Before we dive in, just a word about Greenlight Guru. If you're looking for further risk management training, you should take a look at our risk management for medical devices certification on Greenlight Guru Academy. If you register for the certification by the end of the week, you'll get access to VIP risk management bundle with over 15 valuable resources. Finally, if you're curious about Greenlight Guru and how our ISO 14971 compliance software can automate your risk management process, be sure to head over to our website and request a free demo after this session. Now I'll give a little bit of introduction to our speakers today. Chris has over 25 years of experience in designing medical device software for FDA class one, two and three medical devices. Chris has led organizations through multiple audits and is an expert at quality management systems. Chris has worked at multiple startups and led a team that was first in the nation to successfully develop an implantable device programmer on a mobile platform. Tim has spent 24 years of experience, uh, years experience in IT working for class two and class three medical devices. Uh, he took his previous company completely into the cloud. No server resources were local. He was also part of the product design team to implement a custom cloud data store for the company's third generation device. As a reminder, I encourage you all to ask questions throughout the presentation, and we will get to as many of those as possible at the end. Chris, I'll let you go ahead and take it away. Actually, I'm going to take it. Thank you, Etienne. Sure. Uh, yeah. So this is Tim Sandberg. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, so we're going to start off and talk about the five things you need to know about medical device connectivity. So the benefits of connected medical devices, defining the need for device connectivity, hardware and software considerations, regulatory issues, cybersecurity and privacy factors in the build versus buy decision. Today, we're gonna to focus on cybersecurity, but any of these other uh, issues, if you have any questions about, we have a white paper on our website, galendata.com. Feel free to go and download that. So jumping into cybersecurity, let's talk about some recent news. Ransomware attacks on the Colonial Pipeline and JBS Meat Company. I think we all heard about that. Some major impacts to our economy and shortages created because of that. The Florida water system. This one isn't as widely as known, but attackers were able to briefly increase the amount of sodium in the water supply to fairly dangerous levels. Uh, and that was a fairly simple breach. It was just a system that had been unpatched for several years. And then recently, the Microsoft Exchange attack. Attackers were able to exploit zero-day vulnerabilities that affected nine government agencies, as well as 60,000 private companies in the US alone. These are all fairly major uh, breaches that got a, a good bit of, pos of publicity and could have had uh, impacts on human life, uh, particularly the Florida water system. So some just statistics going into this. Uh, security in healthcare is a big problem too. There are attacks constantly being made against healthcare systems. In 2020 alone, we saw 599 security breaches in the United States, which is a 55% increase from 2019. A vast majority of those, uh, of those were caused due to hacking and 91.2% of these incidents resulted in patient records being compromised. This is likely more underreported data due to many breaches not even being detected uh, for a long time. So the risk of that, uh, loss of data, loss of systems availability, hacked devices, individual devices, and at-risk information, name, address, social security numbers, biometric data, and diagnostic data, just to name a few elements of those. Some more information on statistics. Sophos recently surveyed over 3,500 IT managers globally and found within their organizations that 70% suffered a security incident hosting data in a public cloud. 44% considered data loss or leakage as a top security fear. And 66% have misconfigured cloud devices, creating a vulnerability by leaving backdoors open. DSM, a business cloud provider in Florida, supports these concerns. 66% of IT's professional surveyed list cloud security as their number one concern in implementing an enterprise cloud computing strategy. More than 95% of cloud security incidents are caused by the user as opposed to the cloud provider. 
and this reinforces something I'll, I'll mention later on, but typically within security incidents uh, or in security posture, the human being operating the computer is usually the biggest risk to uh, any any operation. Uh, and that requires a lot of training and uh, mitigation to make sure that your your people know that they are the first line of defense for any type of uh, security on computer systems. A mere 12 percent of CSIO, CISOs of global IT organizations fully grasp the effect of GDPR on cloud computing and data storage. And CyberTalk, a cybersecurity blog, at, blog adding to this perspective, almost 80 percent of organizations recently experienced a cloud security breach. And of those, 43 percent endured at least 10 breaches. 67 uh, percent were worried about uh, incorrect security configurations of their cloud production platform. Okay, so talking about some of the security and pr privacy regulations, uh, there's a myriad of security and privacy laws globally, regulations and standards. So some laws that, that are, exist, I'm sure everybody's heard of HIPAA and high tech and GDPR. CCPA is the California Consumer Protection Act, which has become very prominent as of late. Uh, Massachusetts data protection law is mentioned because it uh, is very stringent in its requirements of what a breach is and what you have to report. COPA, the Child Online Privacy and Protection Act. Uh, the Cloud Act is a US federal law to allow access to private records to law enforcement. And the PIPED Act, which is the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, which is uh, relevant to Canada. And then some standards. ISO IEC 27001 is the international standard on how to manage information security. ISO IEC 27018 is a subset of that and it is uh, specifically there to protect PII and PHI information and create risk controls. NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, Cloud Security Alliance, and then the High Trust Common Security Framework, CSF, is a set of controls to meet the requirements of multiple regulations and standards. Uh, High Trust tries to encompass all of this within their, their framework. So if you're meeting this, you are meeting, uh, likely meeting all of these. So managing cybersecurity. Uh, so there's some steps to, that you need to do there. Uh, risk management and assessment. Design with security in mind. Develop a cybersecurity surveillance program. Set up appropriate agreements with all parties involved and establish a culture of cybersecurity. So we're gonna dive into each one of these. Let's talk about risk assessment. Risk planning and assessment. Start with a thorough risk planning assessment that focuses on data privacy and security. Review the data elements to be collected or stored and consider which fall under the definition of protected data. Under HIPAA, this assessment includes any data that can be reasonably used to identify a person or a small group of people. The word reasonably is key. Data such as average age, weight, or height are not protected because you cannot reasonably use them to identify a person. However, data such as social security numbers are protected because they can be associated with a single person or a small group of people. Similarly, if multiple data points can be used in conjunction to identify a person, this data can be considered protected. For example, a record containing information about a patient's age, height, and weight the name of the individual's doctors and appointment schedules could lead someone to reasonably guess who the information belongs to. Keep in mind, some laws are more stringent than others concerning what data is considered protected. In evaluating the harms, you should assess what would happen if a piece of data is altered, stolen, deleted, or accessed in an unauthorized manner. Determine what the harm could be to the patient, the operator, and of course, your business. Conversely, what would happen if that data that is intended to be captured is not stored or processed? Could there be risks to your company or the patient? There may be equally devastating harm if the, patient, if the device falls to make, fails to make use of vital data in ways that can help the patient. This, may, this task may seem burdensome. Fortunately, there are a lot of tools available to help. Some examples include Microsoft Threat Modeling Tool and Health IT Gov Security Risk Assessment Tool. And then consider the harms across your entire ecosystem, the patient, user safety, business reputation, financial penalties, employee morale, et cetera. All of these are very interrelated. A, a breach 
of any system is not just isolated to that system. It is it affects the entire company in all these different ways. And these should be taken into consideration when you when you do your risk assessment. Okay, design. So design with security in mind. So security should be the at the forefront of any design and should be the top of your requirements that you generate for your software. So it is important that your software and hardware teams follow good cybersecurity engineering practices. Start with making security requirements a core part of your design process and ensuring hardware and software engineers are trained to prevent accidental inclusions of security risks and issues in the design. The security mindset goes hand in hand with the culture of cybersecurity previously mentioned. Periodic review of requirements and maintaining a bill of materials for both hardware and software is also important for maintaining the security of, security of your design. So identity and identify an identity and access management. For electronic systems, users should be allocated a unique identifier, which seems pretty obvious, such as a login ID or email address. They should be required some form of secret, such as a password and a link to them to enter the system. This requirement not only restricts unauthorized access, but allows you to accurately keep track of who has accessed the system, when and from where. It is important to keep a record of all system logins for traceability purposes. Another consideration is for device identity and authentication to ensure only permissible individual devices are allowed to access your electronic systems. From a practical perspective, ensure that developers are following these best practices and using strong hashing methods for the storage of secrets. The Adobe breach of 2013, where 38 million records were compromised, demonstrated the importance of this. In that particular hack, uh, the Adobe so poorly uh, stored everyone's passwords that every almost 38% of them were be able to be recovered by hackers as plain text. Authentication. Passwords are the most common form of a secret, but they are not necessarily the most secure method. People tend to use the same password across different systems, write them down or store them somewhere obvious so that they remember them. It is important to have minimum length and complexity requirements, an expiration for passwords, and rules regarding usage. Also ensure that staff members are trained in password best practices. You could also consider additional security through physical items such as a USB or smart card or app-based one-time passwords. Multi-factor authentication is also considered an important element to a user login scheme and sending a one-time user code to a user's known devices to establish their identity. Encryption it is important to use the appropriate level of encryption for stores and transfer of data to mitigate a major risk issue for patients, either due to theft or alteration of data. Generally, the higher the risk, the higher the level of encryption you need. Make sure you're not relying on hard-coded passwords for device-to-server authentication, and use established protocols such as OAuth and key management systems so you can look up and inquire important keys and secrets at runtime. Audit trails. Systems should be designed so that users have access to only the data they need. This access should be reviewed periodically, especially as they have employee turnover or roles change. Systems should also be designed to accurately capture any changes made to data. For example, they should know who accessed specific data, what change was made, and when the, ch when the change was made. You should also have a policy to periodically review the audit log. Always pay attention to ensure that there has been no breach and that proper access controls are still in place. Software BOM, or Bill of Materials. Every single modern programming language leverages frameworks, libraries, and the ability to integrate software packages for specific functionality. This enables development teams to focus on the core functionality of your software and spending less time reinventing the wheel. Maintaining a bill of materials of all the outside software that went into building the application, as well as the tools used to develop it, are critical for evaluating the applicability of security patches and any other published vulnerabilities. They can enable rapid response and decrease your overall risk as you move forward maintaining your software. And finally, security testing. Ensure adequate design verification is done for security as well. Verification could include tasks such as penetration testing and security scanning. You may even choose to perform ethical hacking as a test. Just as you would verify your device for functionality and clinical effectiveness, you must verify for cybersecurity. Cyber, managing your cybersecurity monitoring. Creating a cybersecurity program is often overlooked at the importance of 
implementing a overall program within your company. The FDA has released a guidance document detailing how to approach post-market cybersecurity issues, including recommendations to assess risk based on the likelihood and impact of an attack. It identifies five key areas. So identify, so develop the organization's understanding to identify and manage cybersecurity risks to systems, assets, data, and capabilities based on the findings of a comprehensive risk management assessment consistent with the unique requirements of the organization. Protect, develop and implement the appropriate safeguards to ensure the delivery of essential services and to limit or contain the impact of a potential cyber attack. Detect, develop and implement the appropriate activities to identify the occurrence of a cybersecurity event, such as a continuous security monitoring and detection processes. Respond, develop and implement the appropriate activities to take action in connection with a detected cybersecurity event, such as those identified in, in an established response plan. And finally, recover, develop and implement the appropriate activities to maintain plans for resilience and restore any capabilities or services that were impaired due to a cybersecurity event. And then understanding all the requisite transnational, national, state, and local reporting requirements. This is important uh, because reporting requirements vary widely. If you're not directly familiar with what those requirements are, identify a resource that has expertise prior to a breach happening is critical. Often there are time limits placed on state and local reporting that you may not be aware of that increase the penalties significantly if, if they're missed. And then finally, use cross-functional teams. Ensure that your team assigned to incident response con constitutes members across different functions such as engineering, IT operations, regulatory, management, and et cetera. Train team members on those plans and run simulations to be better prepared. And ensure the company has adequate insurance coverage for an event resulting in financial losses such as lawsuits or government-imposed penalties and fines. Liability, set up appropriate agreements with your with the various parties involved, such as business associate agreements and data processing agreements. For protected health data, ensure there is consent either directly from the patient or a third party, such as a hospital or a clinic. If you are working with a hospital or clinic, make sure you have a, a BAA in place allowing access to patient data for business use. This has also put some responsibility on you to maintain data privacy. If you're covered under the GDPR and are outsourcing any aspect of product operations, including the hosting servers themselves, ensure you have a data processing agreement with the vendor that covers their role and responsibilities. Okay, uh, this is one of the most important features, I believe, of a cybersecurity program is the culture, maintaining a culture of cybersecurity within your organization. As I mentioned previously, uh, human beings are the weakest link in any computer system, and it's very important and often underappreciated aspect of that security protection, consequently. Your team members must understand what cybersecurity risk is, what to look out for, and how to implement best practices. Your workforce can potentially be the weakest link when it comes to cybersecurity if it has not been trained effectively. For example, employees should know not to click on suspicious links and should understand what phishing and baiting attacks look like. It is a good idea to have software, security software such as antivirus or anti-malware software installed on desktops and laptops and set them for automatic updating. And cybersecurity training should be ongoing as it is easy for people to forget and fall into bad practices. You should also regularly review training materials and update them as new threats, risks, and practices evolve. I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, in previous uh, situations that I've, I've seen, it's been very easy for uh, companies to, to have loss because uh, simple things such as a, someone calling and asking for the CFO and finding out that they're on vacation and then a, an email is sent this spoof to look like that CFO to uh, someone in accounting where they ask for money to be wired transferred to this account and that person knowing the CFO is on vacation just does it. Uh, they don't wanna bother them and that results in significant loss very quickly. 
So it's important that everyone be made aware down to the the any employee, even the janitor, I would recommend. If they're gonna use a computer for any reason whatsoever, they should be trained on this and it should be reviewed at least annually, uh, if not more often. Uh, new attacks come out, new new vectors of, of approach uh, happen all the time and it's important that everybody be informed and keep that, that mindset in, as they go through their daily uh, operations at work. Okay. Hey, right, Tim, can you hear my mic okay? Yeah, you sound great. All right. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, quick question to you, Tim. I'm, I'm just kind of curious. And sorry, I was having a little bit of mic problems at the beginning. Uh, so as much technical capability we might have, as much cybersecurity encryption, uh, I know that uh, we're all told not to click on links, but would you agree that the, the weakest link in all of our cybersecurity systems is the human being? Absolutely. Again, it, it, human the human factor can't be overlooked. It, it, human beings co configure systems. They make changes to those systems. They answer the phone. Uh, you have your IT help desk who gets uh, password reset requests happen all the time. All of these are, are e very easy vectors for creating an insecure configuration. If, they, if someone doesn't understand the implications of making a change, which is why change control is so important if you want to maintain your security posture and making sure that uh, they don't, you know, click on any suspicious links. Anybody clicks on any suspicious links in their in their email or your help desk, if they get a call from somebody saying they need a, a password reset and oh, well, I don't have time to do it, just give it to me over the phone right now. That is a huge red flag. There's no reason to give out a password over the phone. Uh, because you can't you can't verify the identity of that person. Um, it's easy to spoof phone numbers and caller ID. Um, you know, it, especially in very large organizations where the help desk person may not know the person calling in personally and may not recognize their voice. Uh, these are all very simple things, and they happen all the time. Yeah. So when I go to that trade show, that conference, and I see that very nice free, you know. 50 megabyte USB drive. Should I take that home and plug that in my laptop? Um, well, <laughs> that depends. Um, is it a trusted source? Um, is the company handing it out a trusted source? Typically, uh, not allowing portable media to be plugged into a work computer that has access to secure systems uh, is a good policy to have in place. You should not allow portable media to be plugged into anything that has access to that. Um, if you take one from a trade show and take it home, plug it into something personal, make sure you have your antivirus up to date before you do that. Um, I know that I was at a company where we implemented a, a new phone system and a within a day I got a link saying, here's your new phone message. And it was a phishing attack and it just, it all was timing. And yep. I gave it a second look and it was a total bogus link. So uh, thank you for that. And we'll, we'll hit a Q&A here real quick. but. A little bit about Galen. Galen is a turnkey platform purpose-built. We are purpose-built for the medical device industry. We design and operate as an FDA class three medical device. And what, what you all might not know is Tim has deep expertise in class three implantable devices. He's also done startups. He's built cloud platforms before joining Galen. So we're very fortunate. Tim brings you know 25 plus years of medical device, class three medical device industry uh, to Galen, Galen, and we're very fortunate about that. Galen is also ISO 1345 certified, which is a globally recognized quality management system. We started our high trust certification. Uh, Tim and our, our chief information security officer is leading that effort. It's a nationally recognized cybersecurity um, standard along with data privacy. Our goal for Galen is to have that high trust certification by the end of this year. And, you know, I've learned this the hard way. The true test of, of any software system is time. Time is the true maturity test of software. Uh, anybody that's developed software, we know we usually don't get the bugs out until version three, no matter how hard we try. Every day Galen exists, uh, we drive down risk. So, uh, Tim, can you take us to the last slide, please? So, some key takeaways here is Connected Health is here to stay. 
manage risks. We need to manage risks every day, security, privacy, regulatory costs. Where there are some risks in, inherent to all this, the benefits such as the convenience, better patient compliance, improved insights, and ultimately better health outcomes far outweigh those risks. I hope this, in, this presentation provided you some insight into that journey and was very helpful. Cool, thank you, Tim. I really appreciate it and thank you, Chris. Um, we did get some questions from the audience, so I'll just kind of uh, shoot them your way here. So one of them um, I thought was good. Data, uh, like patient, uh, so forth, uh, being collected at offsite at multiple locations for clinical trials. So they say, this keeps me up at night. Is there a security protocol for this? How do you how do you kind of manage all that? So it, it depends on how you're collecting those at multiple sites. Are you, are you trying to send them in electronically? Uh, if you're doing something like that, then a product like the Galen Cloud would be perfect for you because it centralizes all your data in one spot. And our product ensures that the data being transmitted is secure during transmission and then we encrypt it in storage as well. So that would be the most straightforward way of doing that. There's a couple different other options there, uh, but the using a product like the Galen Cloud would be your, your best option there. Uh, any other way has a lot of risks such as uh, doing data entry locally or scanning anything if you're still using paper forms in this day and age uh you could you could have encrypted hard drives and be mailing those around but that's a very high risk activity okay so so it's kind of a follow-up question to that uh, because you mentioned the cloud and so forth one of the other questions we had was why do you think clouds are safe versus local intranet it was a little multifaceted question starting with why do you think clouds are safe versus local intranet are firewalls out of date what about data silos physical virtual Oh wow, there's a lot there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so in in general, I, the clouds that are purpose built for the the transmission of storage and data, I feel are, are inherently safer uh, because security as was the first consideration. It's the top of the requirements, uh, especially for our product. I know that security is is always paramount in the design and maintenance of that of our system. So. You know, we do we do penetration testing, we configuration management. We really make sure that the your data is kept secure all the way through the entire process. So um, a local intranet, you know, sitting behind a firewall, you know, that could be safe. Um, you know, it depends on how many people have access to that firewall, uh, and within people who do have legitimate access to that network behind it uh it's been shown that most internal security breach or most security breaches are usually due to an internal individual who has unauthorized access to a database or to a data store and they're the ones who have who have copied that data out um so using a, an intranet it's it's legitimate but you still have to go through the same exercise as if you were designing a cloud product. You need to make sure that you have access controls in place, you're auditing that, and uh, ensuring that the data, anytime it's moved, goes somewhere, ends up in a legitimate spot. Uh, one thing that is often overlooked is getting PHI, PII data accidentally on a end user's laptop. If you're storing it in an intranet and someone's doing development work against it and they're downloading data files as like a CSV to do some testing on their on their local laptop and then they go to a coffee shop or even if they're working in a coffee shop and they're not taking care to encrypt or shield that data, that's a that's considered a breach. You've you've just exposed PHI and PII to people, to unauthorized individuals. So I think you know, based, using a cloud-based approach uh, that Galen uses is, is far superior to that. Uh, firewalls, I think firewalls still have a legitimate value uh, in, in terms of, of keeping kind of that walled garden of data within a corporate network. Uh, for uh, the, the biggest problem there is firewalls can easily, the firewall rules can easily get very complex and can have some unintended changes. So if you are managing uh, 
protected data behind a firewall, it's really critical and key that you are doing testing against the rules and you're doing change control and testing uh, for changes you're making to those rules that, and the people who are authorized to make that change uh, are trained to know what to do. It's so simple to introduce a rule that invalidates something farther down the line and, and completely opens you up. So, uh, you know, I think they do have value. I just, we need to, you just need to make sure that you're following all those controls and, and, and testing your rules before you deploy them in a production environment. Okay, great, thank you, Tim. Um, and another kind of build on question to that, because you mentioned user access. Another question specifically asked about that, she says, my question relates to user access specifically. We have applications that perform manufacturing execution, and I'm wondering what the best practice or who typically owns administrative user access. Is it best to have someone from IT or quality have this access? I'm worried with the current individual that has admin rights, it may pose a conflict of interest. So anywhere where you think there's a conflict of interest, you should mitigate that by uh, removing their admin access. If, if they, uh, you know that that and that's actually a tenant of 21 CFR 11, uh, where if you have that kind of access that could potentially alter data in a way that's not traceable, um, then it, it actually mandates that two people be able to make that change. Then, uh, in any environment, having one single person as your administrator and only that single person is a huge risk. Um, just if they leave the company, if something untoward was to happen to them, uh, such as a car accident or anything like that, you're immediately at risk for um, for not being able to even access or, or change your or, or manage your systems. I'm sorry, and that's a big deal. So you should always have at least two people who are administrators. If you do perceive a conflict of interest between someone having an administrative role and then their day-to-day -day job duties uh, involving the system then it's best to take away their, their administrative access and give it to somebody else in, in IT or or vice versa, um, whatever your situation is. But conflicts of interest are hard to justify when you're, when you're audited. Uh, why does this person have this access when they can also do, their job is to do X and, you know, could they potentially be altering quality records, you know, because they found an error, a mistake they made, and they're going in and altering computer records. I mean, your system should be auditing for that, but it's still better to have that split responsibility of of the IT person being the administrator and then this person only having the access they need to do their job, no more, no less. Okay, cool. So if we take this back to risk, there's a couple of questions specifically talking about um, ISO 14971, for example, this one says, in terms of risk management for ISO 14971, how can you calculate the probability of occurrence of a cybersecurity attack or breach? Well, I approach it from the, from the view of evaluating what your attack surface looks like. So what I'm talking about is the access to your systems, what ports are open, um, how are there different access of avenues into your production systems? Who has that access? Uh, how is that access controlled? Um, so if you're using um, standard tools, uh, and I'm just going to use AWS because we leverage AWS for our daily operations, their identity and access management is very is a very good tool and we enforce multi-factor authentication on everything so we know going getting into systems is predicated on having that uh leveraging that i identity and access management so um so that is considered a relatively low risk versus if you develop something uh custom to get into your systems um you know, as I was talking about with, uh, I mentioned the Adobe hack of 2013. You know, if if you're developing your own authentication system to get into get into your product or get into your other systems, uh, you you really need to make sure you're following the latest and greatest best practices for encrypting passwords, hashing them, uh, storing other secrets that you may use, and creating a multi-factor authentication, uh, because those get tested 
you know, hackers test logins all the time. They're constantly trying to get in. It doesn't matter what. If someone finds an, a page that says login, they try. There's always bots trying to to do those things. So evaluating the the type of login access management you're using is also a big part of that risk assessment. Um, and then any other controls, do you, you know, you're doing intrusion protection. Um, that's that's important uh, for creating that risk assessment as well. So I, starting with what's exposed, what can be connected to, how can you connect it to it is really the, the basis for starting that risk assessment plan and then building up from there. Um, if you have any systems that communicate externally, uh, what does that look like? Is that authenticated? Is it is it over a secure connection? Um, these are, again, all things to consider when you're building up that risk assessment. Okay. But the biggest thing is looking at what's exposed and how can people access it. Okay. Uh, you did mention that the human is the weakest link when it comes to cybersecurity. I'm always interested in knowing, you know, how you build up your weakest links and so forth. So, uh, and maybe you can give some real life examples so that we can start applying some of these things. Um, and I'll just tack on, you know, for Chris as well, because I know, you know depending on the length of the answer, uh, I may not be able to get any more questions in, but um, there were also some questions about uh, how to get a, a, a trial or maybe a demo and so forth. So maybe we can speak to that at the end here if you if you want to add to that. Sure. Um, but yeah, to talk a little bit about some real life examples in uh, in cybersecurity, that might in be cyber, in, in training. So, um, at a previous employer, uh, we did have an incident where uh, I mentioned previously, you know, that a someone posed as the CFO and that person actually sent money out based on this phishing email. And she did not recognize that the email address, even though it said the CFO's name, she did not recognize that um, the actual email address itself was bogus. And those are the kind of things that give you nightmares. Um, I know that that was very, that was a very long time ago. And since then, you know, making people aware, even if it's uh, something simple, like uh, I encourage all of the employees, if you get something that doesn't look right, don't, don't click on anything in it. If you, think there's maybe just some potential that it could be something that is important. I have them forwarded on to a, a mailbox that I review often, and I evaluate it from an IT security potential uh, perspective, I mean, uh, to see is this legitimate or is this spam? And 99% of the time it's spam. And I can rep or just respond, hey, this is spam. So I encourage employees to do that. I remind them all the time to do that sort of, um, hey, if you don't think it's legit, forward it on. Um, and those kinds of things, if I receive an example in my email, I will uh, we'll, uh, deactivate any links in it, and then I will forward it on and say, hey, this is going around, you know, as a sample of, of a potential phishing attack. Remember, you know, don't click any links or do anything like that. Uh, so, I encourage like constant feedback in terms of that. You can't just train everybody once, once a year and say, hey, everybody, don't do these things and you know, hope that everyone remembers. We're all human beings. If, if you don't constantly exercise that thought process, that mindset, it's very easy to fall into uh, just complacency and, and um, not do any of those things just oops i accidentally clicked this and now the entire network is encrypt you know being encrypted by ransomware so it's you know i find that small constant reminders are much better than doing just a big annual training and hoping everybody remembers uh that's not to say we don't do at least annual training on all this we do but you know stuff throughout the year, a program that encourages people, talks about different phishing attacks, uh, different uh, vectors for getting in is really critical. And that also goes for your developers. You know, training, getting them the training, making sure that they are using best practices, 
uh, as those best practices evolve, are they keeping up with those? Um, your quality people, are they, when they're doing code reviews, are they also aware of those best practices? Are they trained to what to look for? So it's all a very big integrated program and it's really critical that you create that culture that everybody is not afraid to raise you know, issues or have questions. The last thing you want is someone saying, hey, is this email safe? Or I got a phone call about this and being berated by um, someone who is like, well, of course it is. What are you, stupid? That's the last thing anybody should res respond to that is because they're legitimately reaching out and asking and it should always be encouraged to do that. If you're not sure, ask someone who knows and, and encourage that. Don't don't discourage it at all. Don't don't allow any of your personnel who may answer that question to to talk down to somebody about that because and I see that a lot. I've seen that a lot. I don't see it anymore, but I've seen it in other organizations where um, people were they would ask those questions. Just a simple, hey, is this email safe? Is it legit? And they would be berated for it. And that's you can't do that. That that encourages the opposite of what you're trying to do here. Yeah, great points. Um, and I, so we only have a few minutes left. Uh, there were some questions about how to get a little bit more information. So I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add, Chris or Tim. Um, sure. And, and uh, just to back up, Tim, I have sent emails to Tim saying, is this link valid? And so nobody in the company should be berated for that at all. Uh, and I have I don't have a lot of access. As a matter of fact, I have no access to any of our company database related to the Galen Cloud. So we isolate, we segment. Um, we also will do internal phishing attacks on ourselves to make sure that we're staying, you know, vigilant. It's it's not any one thing. It's a series of things and ongoing. Uh, to contact us at Galen Data, if you're interested in the sales or demo, it's sales at GalenData.com. If you want to reach out directly to Tim, it's Tim at GalenData.com. And if you have questions for me, I'd love to talk to you guys. It's Chris at GalenData.com. Awesome. Well, um, all right. I really appreciate it. It uh, was great to be with you all today. And we thank all of our listeners. Um, and we hope you're enjoying our Risk Virtual Summit so far. Um, all right. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, and, and let's, let, one shout out to Greenlight Guru. Uh, they're an awesome platform, quality management systems. They're like Galen, but they manage uh, all the documents and quality processes in, Cap in Kappa. So thank you all for letting us be part of your day. And Green Eye Guru is, is an awesome platform too. And they, uh, they're they world-class in, in quality management systems and design control. So it was fun being with this, uh, with this team today. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, everybody take care. We'll see you next time. Thank you.